Uh, hi, can you hear me? Yeah, sounds good. Okay, so thanks to Rodrigo and the organizers for inviting me to, to this conference, and thank you for coming, of course. So uh, I'm going to speak about uh, attack planning scenarios and uh, more specifically, probabilistic attack planning. And um, so I'll, I'll start just uh, with a brief presentation so you can understand the, the context in which this, this research took place. So uh, the Pong company that I work for is uh, Core Security Technologies. And uh, it's got uh, an office in, in Boston, in the US, where all the marketing and sales guys are. And uh, all the research and development is actually done in, uh, in Buenos Aires. And uh, the founders of the, the company are from Argentina. So it, it started in, in Argentina uh, with six guys, you know, uh, crazy about hacking and etc., who uh, didn't want to have bosses. So they say, OK, the best way to not have bosses is to start our own company. And uh, so it started growing. And, uh, and eventually, since uh, we weren't able to sell anything in Argentina or Brazil, we say, OK, we have to sell in, in the US. And now the company presents itself as headquartered in, in Boston, but the real work is in, is in Buenos Aires. And uh, so uh, people ask me about the, the different teams and, and the company. Uh, in, in the U.S., I think there are like 50 people, and, and in Buenos Aires, we are like uh, 100. And there are, uh, for example, there is a specific team uh, developing exploits. We have 15 guys only writing exploits, and there are uh, about 10 guys in testing, testing that the, ex the, the exploits actually work, and uh, they do regression testing, etc. Uh, then we have also a consulting team, and uh, we have obviously the, the people working on the, the kernel of, of impact of the product. So they're, they're developing in, in C++. And we also have a, a research lab, which is uh, where I work. And uh, as Rodrigo said, we, uh, we work on prototypes and ideas to include in, uh, in the product in the future. And we also do fun stuff that, that we like. And uh, and we also coordinate research uh, activities that uh, take place uh, across the, the company. Everybody in, in the company spends some time doing research. We have like research slots of uh, two weeks, and, and people get to spend time uh, researching anything that, that they want. And we also have uh, an activity that involves everybody, which uh, we call the bug week. We stop everything during one week and start looking for bugs in anything that, that we find. And, uh, and it's really fun. We are organizing teams of about five, six people. And so in the team, you have like uh, explore writers working uh, with girls from uh, human resources and administration. So it's really cool. And it's a way to, uh, to exchange knowledge. And, and yeah, uh, I don't know if the girls come from human resources learn a lot, but unless they get to see the guys working and see the tools, they get to see our product, for example, that usually they don't see. And, um, and so we also, uh, well, based on that, that research, we, we publish uh, advisories. So uh, I've been working on that for a long time. Uh, we've published like 100 uh, advisories. So we have yeah, quite a lot of experience yeah, dealing with the vendors and all that stuff. And, uh, and my, my personal research is more focused on applying uh, artificial intelligence techniques to solve problems uh, that arrive. So uh, artificial intelligence, I don't know, for some people it sounds cool, for other people it sounds like bullshit. <laughs> and uh, it's, I don't know, artificial intelligence promised a lot of things when, when it began, but now it has like over, I don't know, 30 years of history. And there are like proven techniques that, that we can use from that. So we're not going to emulate the, the human brain, but we have uh, tools that we can use. Uh, and so we'll uh, present the, the model that uh, the model that we have developed to uh, uh, because uh, uh, to apply planning uh, techniques you need to model the, the problems that you're actually solving and uh, that's what I'm going to present and uh, especially focus on the the agents that's what we understand by agents and then I will present the the, the last algorithms that we have developed. Uh, which work for probabilistic uh, planning, 
and are quite efficient. So that's why I call them fast probabilistic algorithms. Uh, so the, the first question is, okay, why do we need automation? Uh, the, the pen testings have, uh, have evolved and, uh, and the attacks also, and uh, the organizations are each day more complex. No? You have uh, more machines, you have uh, different technologies uh, mixed in, you have, I don't know, voice over IP, Wi-Fi, uh, and uh, the networks are bigger also. Uh, so this makes uh, manual pen testing uh, each time more, uh, it requires more time to do it and more expertise. No, you have to know about a lot of uh, different technologies. And, uh, and one thing that uh, we see coming in, in the future is uh, continuous pen testing. So uh, now the, the organizations, when they want to do a pen test, they hire some consultants who uh, spend two or three weeks doing a pen test and they give them a, a snapshot no, of the security of their network. And uh, if we can take snapshots like this uh, every month or every week, then uh, we get what we call continuous pen testing. And we can really see the evolution of uh, the security of uh, the network. And if you want to do a pen test every week, you have to automate it, or you won't do it manually. Uh, and also, well, the, the tools for doing pen testing are, are evolving. I think uh, everybody knows Metasploit, which is an open source tool uh, for developing and executing exploits. Well, now it has been bought by Rapid7, so we have to see what will happen with the future of Metasploit, but it's still open source. Then you have uh, Immunity Canvas. No, there are guys on, from Immunity here. And you have Core Impact, which are both commercial. And uh, well, one of uh, the objectives with automation is to improve the pen testing scale. Now, for example, if uh, you have to pen test a network with 500 machines, and you have a small team, you have uh, usually a bounded time frame. No, you have two weeks to do the pen test. And uh, what is more important is that uh, the pen test should mimic attacks that uh, doesn't have those limitations. No? So you want, in two weeks, with your small team, to find all the possible attacks that an attacker who can spend two months will do. Uh, and so for this, we, we need automation. And also, by uh, automating repetitive, repetitive tasks, uh, we can liberate time for doing research and doing more fun stuff, or I don't know reading, getting up to date, and uh, I mean, that's why we use computers in the first place, no? Because we are lazy and we want to just let the computer do all that he can. And it will also allow the, the attacker to produce more complex attacks. No? And uh, another important thing is that we want to make it uh, more accessible, no? We want uh, the, uh, the administrators of the network to be able to use this tool and actually test the network without being experts in pen testing. And uh, so for a project like uh, Metasploit, it would mean more users, and for Core Impact, it would mean more consumers. So that's good also. And this is a, well, a, a small, typical scenario that uh, we want to attack. And uh, you have here the, the attacker who's uh, connecting through the, the internet. And uh, in, that, in that enterprise, in that scenario, you have in the DMZ uh, some servers, the web server, mail server, DNS server. And in the back office, you have the workstations of the users and more servers, database and administration servers. So uh, in this scenario, what, what would you do? What, uh, how would you begin uh, trying to, ah, and the objective is to get into the network, no? Attack a machine and read some information, uh, confidential information, etc. So just through anything, there are lots of possible things to do, no? Anyone want to risk an idea? Try a social Ah, you would begin by doing social engineering. Uh -huh. Yeah, so trying to get directly into a workstation, you can also uh, yeah, use client-side attacks. You know, sending mails with attachment and see if 
some guy will, will click on the attachment. And yes, that's a good path because usually a percentage will click on the attachment and that way you get directly into the workstation and then from an internal workstation you have uh, trust relations with the servers and you get access to those servers. So that's a good way. And actually it's what uh, is being used more and more in the, uh, in the pen test. So which uh, other ways could you enter in, in this network? Yes. Okay, so the classical old school way to do it would be like, okay, you try to root a box inside the DMZ. Uh, let's say you uh, you got a remote Apache or something. Yeah. So you get you uh, you get access inside the yeah inside the DMZ, and then you try to somehow get into the LAN. So, uh, for instance, could be like a relationship, trust relationship with the database or something like that to go through the firewall. Um, I mean, that's a real old school way, classical way to do it. Um, and yeah, the, the other obvious uh, uh, way to do it, like, like we just said, is like uh, go directly inside the network through client side or something like that, right? Thanks. So this uh, is more or less the, the old cool uh, scenario that Jonathan was describing. You attack a machine and, uh, on the DMZ. And when you attack that machine and you take control, uh, in, uh, in our terms, you install an agent there. So from that machine, you can uh, continue the attack as if you were really installed here. Uh, once you install an agent, it's like you're sitting in front of that machine and you can do anything. Uh, that you would do being here. So from there, getting through the firewall, you could uh, attack the administration server and from there attack the workstations or here, for example, we suppose this database server is, is our objective. So what I, I want to, uh, to keep you in mind is this picture that uh, we will have to uh, perform an attack which uh, will take several steps and um, and uh, install like a chain of agents to get to our, our, our final objective. So in the scenarios that we are thinking, we have no direct connectivity with uh, the machine that we really want to attack. So uh, what I'm going to present now is uh, how we model the, these things that happen in the real world so that we can apply uh, planning techniques on that. And here is another small example. And uh, we have a, a target network, and we want to, um, to gain control of any machine. And uh, the assets are like uh, our initial conditions. What have we got uh, in the beginning? We have the IP address of, uh, of this network. And of course, I have my box from which I'm attacking. And I have some uh, information gathering tools and exploits. And the actions that uh, I can see is uh, to, to prop ports to see if I have connectivity, and I have four exploits. No, for uh, uh, OpenBSD, Linux, Windows, uh, attacking SSH, UFTP, IIS, Apache. And, and so um, these are the actions that can give me the, the goal, taking uh, control of the box. And these actions have some requirements. For example, if I want to uh, attack SSH, I need connectivity with the port 22. If I want to attack IIS or Apache, I need connectivity with the port 80. And if I want to attack WFTP, it's on the port 21. <coughs> and this can uh, be done by probing, no? That's what we call a probe probe. You try to connect, and if, if you have connectivity, you know that you can launch that exploit. So uh, what would be the, the plan here? Because it's very limited, no? I don't, we know that we have to start with the port probe, but then uh, which exploit uh, would you execute first? Just looking at this graph. Port, you would start with port 22. 
Ah, uh, if you follow the, the order, yeah. That's one idea, no? You have all the exploit, and you say, okay, I'll just do it in uh, any order that, that I have. Well, that's uh, why we want to add some uh, planning techniques over that, no? And, well, first one conclusion that uh, we can make in this scenario is that uh, when I will do the, the port scan, I only have to test uh, the ports 21, 22, and 80. Now it's useless to do a full port scan and see a lot of, lot of information about other ports if I don't have an exploit for, for those ports. And the other conclusion is uh, that I should here port the, the port 80 first because I have two exploits. So knowing that I have connectivity will allow me to do two actions. And so it's better start with this one. And as soon as I find the port open, well, just run the exploit and see if I get the goal. If it doesn't, continue with the others. So it's a very small example, but we can see the, the relationship between actions uh, taking place. So in, a, in our model, we have uh, the goals, which are the, the objectives of, uh, of the attack. So a typical goal would be, I don't know, uh, get into the database server and obtain the, the credit card numbers. And the assets are uh, all the things that an attacker uh, need to obtain during the attack. And uh, for example, an operating system asset mean uh, getting the precise information about the operating system to be able to, to choose the exploits. Uh, TCP connectivity, well, it's obvious uh, having a connectivity. And an agent asset means installing a, an agent on the machine. And uh, the actions are all the, the steps that we will execute uh, during the attack. So they are the, the, the basic steps, not the atomic ones. And uh, in our model, an, an exploit is a basic action. It has some requirements, it does a lot of things that we don't care about, and he will give us the results. So in this model, we, uh, we make an abstraction. No, we, uh, we don't know all the, the details of what the, the exploit is going to do with the memory and stuff, but we know the, the result that it will give us. And the agents are the ones who perform the, the actions, no, the, the subjects of, uh, of the verbs. And uh, so we put all this in a, in a graph. We call it the, the attack graph. And uh, where, where you have uh, nodes corresponding to uh, assets and not corresponding to, to actions. And uh, basically, the, the actions have an error, like giving you a, a result, and have requirements or preconditions, which are all the things that uh, you need to obtain to execute that action. And uh, I don't know, typically for, a, for an exploit, uh, you need to know the, the operating system and the architecture before launching it, otherwise it's going to fail. And uh, if you have an exploit for HTTP, well, you need an open port and test the, the connectivity before. So this is uh, what it will look like. Now we start uh, to construct the graph. We start with the objective, for example, here is uh, to install a system agent on a host on the internal network no? with uh, IP 13.3. Uh, and uh, one thing that can give us that is an exploit, for example here Apache chunked encoding, an old school one, that requires that the operating system is OpenBSD and uh, to have TCP connectivity with port 80. And so how do we get uh, those assets? Well, to uh, find the operating system, we have uh, different OS detection modules. One is uh, to use a banner grabber and based on the, on the banner, uh, deduce the operating system. Or use a module using a stack fingerprinting. This is the, the technique of a Nmap. I don't know if you know it. Sends different packets and study the variations in the responses of uh, the TCP implementation and based on that, in first the, the operating system. And well, and to have connectivity, it's easy, you know, you just try to connect, that's, the action is TCP connect. So, uh, what do we need for this one? Well, to uh, use the, the module based on banners, you have to grab the banners. Uh, and to use the module based on the stack fingerprinting, you need IP connectivity. And uh, here to uh, try to connect, uh, you need to have first an agent 
that will have the capability to establish TCP connections. And we can continue that way, no? The banners are given by an action called Banner Grabber, IP connectivity given by IP Connect, and etc. And uh, well, for the, the examples that I show, uh, I have to uh, choose like a very small subset of a, of a real graph. Uh, this is what uh, the complete graph would look in a very small uh, example. Th that would be a scenario with uh, maybe 10 machines and 10 exploits, and you see that the graph is already quite huge. And uh, if you want to build a, the complete graph uh, in, a, in a real world scenario where you have, I don't know, 200 or 500 machines and uh, 500 exploits, well, simply constructing the complete graph uh, is, uh, is too expensive. It won't fit in memory. So uh, that's one big uh, problem uh, that came during this research, no? Because when we started, we say, ah, okay, we can construct the attack graph, and ah, well, just, let's just look at the requirements and we'll build it backwards. And, uh, and then we realized that we aren't even able to construct the complete attack graph. So we need uh, techniques to find the path in this graph without obviously exploring it, but without even uh, constructing it. And, uh, and this is where we have like, uh, to use uh, special ideas, because uh, in, um, in, in the papers that uh, we found in, when we were doing this research, we started obviously reading what others were doing with, uh, with Atagraph, and the guy starts working with the complete graph. So uh, they work on small scenarios like this, and they have this complete graph that they can analyze. But uh, in real world scenarios, uh, you can't even do that. So we'll see what we can do. And, uh, ah, and another thing is that uh, the, the usual um, uh, papers do is that uh, they only work on, uh, on predicates. No? So all the things that, uh, the, that I've shown are uh, translated to predicates that can be true or false. And, um, and um, this is not uh, very realistic because um, when you execute an, an exploit, it, defend, it depends on a lot of things. And, uh, and you can't simply uh, think that if he knows the operating system and the application, it would always give you an agent installed on that machine. So to add uh, realism, um, we associate a, a probability of a success to the, to the actions. So that, that's what I, I put here. And, uh, and the exploits are uh, typically probabilistic. I mean, in fact, the exploits are deterministic, but they depend on so many uh, hidden variables, you know, on the state of the memory, the state of the heap, so that uh, one way of modeling it is simply, OK, so it has a probability of success, and if I test it on uh, different platforms, I can uh, extract a, a success rate. And uh, another thing that we added is the, the cost function, because uh, the actions uh, uh, will take time to execute. You know, an exploit who will do brute forcing will take more time. And they also produce uh, noise. You know, they, they will add network traffic that can be detected. Uh, they will produce log lines and uh, maybe IDS events. And to model that, we need uh, numerical effects. So now our actions will give us a result, but also produce uh, numerical effects. No, Incre uh, increasing the noise, increasing the time, and having a, a probability. So this, when it translates to, to terminals planning, uh, makes it uh, more difficult also. And so that, uh, that was the, the basic uh, model. And now what uh, I want to, uh, to present you it, uh, is the, the agents that uh, we obtain, say a little bit uh, more about that. Well, the, the classical agent is the, the system agent. When uh, you exploit a binary vulnerability, uh, you get access to, to that system. And um, I don't know if uh, you guys have heard about uh, proxy calls. Cisco proxy. And who, who knows what uh, Cisco proxy is? Raise, raise your hand. 
So, okay, not, <laughs> not many people. Uh, there was a, well, there have been several presentations about this. One that uh, I can recommend you is uh, Rodrigo's presentation. He presented that here in a Hackers to Hackers conference, I think in 2006, and it was called a Cisco Proxying Pivoting System. So the, this technology basically is uh, how to construct an agent that will allow you to uh, gain control of a system and then from uh, that machine uh, use it at pivoting stone and continue the attack locally. Um, so in this architecture, the agent is uh, what you get to install in, in that machine and it's called a proxy call server. And uh, the name is a little bit misleading because it's a server, but it's a really, really small code. Uh, actually, it's uh, 300 bytes or 400 bytes of code. So this is what you install uh, on that machine. It's the, um, uh, the payload you know, of, of your exploit. And once you get to uh, execute this, uh, this tiny proxy call server, when you, you connect to that server, you can ask him to, uh, to execute system calls. So when you write uh, the code of, uh, of an exploit, you can, uh, uh, it uh, gives you the opportunity to forget about what you're doing locally and what you're doing on the remote machine. So all the processing and uh, number crashing and everything will be done uh, on your local machine. But when you need to actually access uh, the resources of, uh, of the remote machine, you just send him a system call, he executes the system call and gives you back the result. Uh, so this is how impact works. And uh, well, when you get to install this agent, you can uh, get access to the file system and uh, if it has a network connectivity, when well, you can start sending packets and doing things on, on the network. And uh, the pivoting is transparent. So you can uh, install a chain of uh, these agents and uh, you don't have to worry about all the details about what is going on uh, in the middle. You just send instructions to the one uh, that you want. And uh, now I'm going to present you uh, another uh, agent which is more limited and uh, it's what we call the, the SQL agent, uh, which is basically exploit an SQL injection on a web application. And uh, well, I guess you know what SQL injections are, no? When you have a web application that doesn't filter the, what you send it to him and uh, gives you access to executing uh, SQL statements, no? We have here an example on vulnerable.com. And um, so that's the vulnerability. And uh, the agent is uh, something that uh, is someone that uh, you can give him to him SQL queries and uh, he will f send them back to the database and give you the, the answer. So it's a little bit the, the same idea as uh, the system agent with system calls. You give him a system call, he gives you the, the answer. With this agent, you give him a, a query, he gives you the, the result. So uh, in our metaphor, we say that uh, we have installed the agent on the, on the remote machine. But actually, well, we haven't installed anything. There is no code running there. But we have a way to, uh, to translate SQL comments to the, the communication channel with the, through this vulnerability. So this is uh, what it looks like when we use it. Uh, we are the, the process that uh, wants to execute a, a query. And we send it to, to the agent. He will translate it and, uh, and uh, forge an HTTP request that uh, it will send to the vulnerable web, app web application. And through this web application, we get to execute an SQL query in the database. And uh, the database gives you the, gives the response uh, to, the to the web app. And, um, and the SQL agent then uh, does all the, the parsing of the response and extract uh, the, the information that you wanted and send it back uh, to the process. So uh, if, we are, if we are here, uh, the only thing that we, know we need to know is that we send an SQL query and we get back the result. No? And the agent will uh, hide from us all the, the part on the right. 
So what, uh, what are the benefits? Uh, we have uh, abstract the, the gain capability from all the complexity and the details of the, the vulnerability. And uh, I, I don't know if you have tried to, uh, to explore the SQL injection, but there are lots of, uh, uh, of things that you need to know. There are characters that can be filtered. Uh, you have to sometimes to guess the, the column types. Um, and uh, if it's a blind uh, SQL injection, you have to uh, um, get information, for example, from uh, timing. And so you have to encode all the things in a, in a very obscure channel. And uh, using this agent, well, we get a homogeneous programming interface, no? We just send him the, the queries and, and get back the result. And another benefit for us is uh, that it fits uh, perfectly into the, the planning model. Because uh, we know that this guy will give us uh, this result and uh, we forget about all the, the, the details of the vulnerability. No? So we transform uh, the vulnerability in uh, capability. And uh, this, is, uh, this is how it would look like in a, in a scenario. Now we have this, uh, this vulnerable web server and uh, that gives us access to executing uh, SQL queries here. So we can think that we have gained access to this database server. And uh, from there, we can also uh, escalate and transform this uh, SQL agent into a full system agent and continue the, the attack from there. So a good reference for this is a, is a presentation from uh, Fruz and Diego Tiscornia. They have presented that in, uh, in Haiklu. It's called Zombies 2.0. And uh, another uh, more limited agent is a cross-site scripting agent. Uh, when you have a cross-site scripting vulnerability, you can inject uh, JavaScript code, no? Like this one script uh, source from my site, and you get to execute the egg.js. Uh, 10 minutes. Ah, OK. And, and so the. Um, uh, I have to hurry a little bit. Well, here the, the agent uh, will, uh, will handle the, the attacker's web server and will give you also a simplified uh, API to uh, send actions to the own browser. And, uh, and from that browser, well, basically you can execute JavaScript. So you can uh, uh, scanning ports or stealing the, the cookies, the credentials. And, uh, or open a JavaScript console and execute JavaScript from the, uh, the machine which has the, the vulnerable browser. And here is an, an attack graph involving a system agent, cross-site scripting, and, and SQL agents. And uh, we begin always with the, the same objective, to have a system agent. So on, on the left, uh, you have the, the classical path, no? executing a network exploit which will require you uh, to know the operating system, service, IP connectivity, etc. Or you could use uh, a browser exploit, no? And, uh, and to do this, you need first to have a cross-site scripting agent installed on, the, um, on, on that machine. And this can be given to you by uh, having a cross-site scripting exploit on the web server. And, uh, and to do this, well, you need that uh, this web server is running a, a vulnerable web application. And to find that, you can use a crawler. So that's uh, how they can fit into the, this, this ATA graph. And uh, now I want to, uh, to show you uh, briefly the, the algorithm that, uh, that we have developed. Uh, so, all what I've uh, told you until uh, now is how to model this problem with attack graphs. And uh, now what I'm going to tell you is, OK, how uh, can we uh, find the good algorithms to find the optimal path in, uh, in this attack graph? And uh, I, will, I will start with a very simple scenario and then grow it to uh, more complex ones. And uh, in, in this scenario, we want uh, to, to steal the, the credit card numbers in a, in a database server. And we have a, a set of uh, remote exploits. 
And um, to do this, uh, the attacker has uh, some information. He can uh, estimate the probability of success of uh, the exploit, and he also knows the, the running time. So one thing that uh, you can ask is, okay, well, how many, uh, how many exploits does he have no, to know the size of the problem? And uh, so this is the problem that I have to deal with. No, these are the, the exploits of, of impact. And uh, now it has like uh, 840 exploits. But if you count them, uh, because the exploits have a different uh, uh, supported operating system. And if you count that, it gives you like uh, 5,000 uh, unique targets. So uh, in your algorithm, you know that you have to put 5,000 uh, different exploits. And, uh, and you have to, uh, to make it work on a network with uh, 500 machines also. And uh, another question that uh, you could ask is, OK, uh, from where do you get the, the information about uh, how much time the exploits are, are going to take? And uh, we have two sources of, of information. Uh, one is the, the testing lab. So the, the guys that actually test the exploit have uh, developed um, uh, an infrastructure with uh, virtual machines. And they have uh, more than 700 virtual machines, uh, all with a different operating system and, and applications. And the other source of uh, information is the, the feedback from uh, the users of the product. There is an option to send uh, anonymized feedback, you know, where all the, the sensitive data is, is filtered out. And uh, that is for us in Web Impact. And for example, for Metasploit, that would be a natural option, no? Ask the users to, to send feedback from the, the execution of, of the modules. So that would be a way for them to, to obtain all this, this uh, statistical, statistical data. And uh, so this is uh, the first problem that, that we want to solve. No, we are at uh, one step of uh, the objective. We have all these, uh, these exploits, these actions. We have uh, this probability of success and the running time. And we want to know in which order to execute them uh, to minimize the, the total running time. And uh, so here I, I put a, a small example so that uh, you can think a little bit uh, about the problem. We have. Uh, Four actions, no, think about uh, four exploits. And uh, we have the, the expected running time, no, that's uh, the mean time that, that it takes to execute them. And uh, the, pro the probability is a number between zero and one, and it's like a percentage, no? The, the first one has uh, 55% uh, chances of uh, installing the, the agent. So we have this one, no, 20 seconds. 55%, 30 seconds, 85%, 3 seconds, uh, 2%. Uh, so uh, which one would you execute first and uh, which one second? <laughs> Rodrigo knows the answer. <laughs> you, cannot, you cannot answer. So just throw something. It's uh, an excuse to think a little bit about the, the numbers and, and the problem. So, uh, OK, Jonathan, what's, what would you do first? <laughs> Uh-huh. Excellent. This is a guy who knows. He said <laughs> He said you have to divide uh so which would we compute? Uh, uh so you have to uh Yeah, you divide the probability by the time. Right? The probability divided by the time. Yeah, mm. way more maximum. Uh-huh. Yeah, uh, more or less, but here we have a proposed heuristic. And uh oh. <laughs> 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 and, and so just I don't know, just to, to throw something, which of the four actions uh, would you execute first? Uh, here. The second one. Okay, we have a proposal from Alice, right? The second one. The one that takes 30 seconds but has probability 85%. So, okay, I'll just continue. Um, to, uh, to compute the, the expected value is once you have the, um, uh, the order defined, the total running time will be uh, the time of the first action 
plus uh, this p with a bar is the, the probability of failure. It's one minus p one by the time of the second action, and like this, you can compute the, the total expected running time. And this is the probability of success, not the probability of the first, and it fails, the probability of the second, and etc. And uh, the, the lemma that uh, uh, allows us to, to solve this, uh, this problem is that once you have a, the action sorted by a coefficient, which is actually the time divided by the probability, when you compound the, um, the first n minus one action and you compute this uh, time divided by the compound probability, it will be less than uh, the coefficient for the, for the last one. And uh, this is, you can prove it by, by induction and uh, obviously I won't give you the, the details. But what it uh, basically tells you is that uh, this order is the optimum. And, uh, and so here we, we have a, an algorithm which is uh, sort the actions according to, to this coefficient, you know the time divided by, by the probability, and execute them in, in that order. And uh, the complexity is basically the complexity of, a, of a sorting, so it's uh, n log n, where n is the number of actions. And in our small example, when we compute those coefficients, uh, the best one is the second action, so Mauricio was right. <laughs> and, uh, uh, well, this was a very simple example. Now I want to uh, give you an idea of how this scales into uh, more complex scenarios. Uh, okay, I have to run. The, <laughs> the, the, the following scenario is when we have a strategy. So we have a groups of actions that we already know in which order to, to execute. And uh, this is uh, something uh, very warm, very good that uh, you want to put into your graph because uh, if you already know that uh, after this action uh, the following one will be this one, you don't want to leave it uh, for the planning system to guess. You will just tell him, okay, you have to do this, this, and this. And, uh, and that's a way to incorporate uh, the, the knowledge of, uh, of the expert. Not the guy who's an expert in pen testing, he, say, he knows that uh, you have to do it this way, so you just put it into the planning system. And uh, in this example, uh, it's a privilege escalation. You start with low privileges and you want to obtain system privileges. So you have to uh, refine the OS detection, then verify the, the addition, service packs, etc. and based on that, uh, execute the, the action. So uh, here, when we translate it to, uh, to the theoretical model, we have uh, groups of order actions, no? And we want to minimize the, the total running time. And, uh, and in this problem, where well, you could uh, execute uh, actions from one group and mix them with actions of, uh, of other groups, no? I mean, you have different groups, maybe you can choose one from there, then one from there to see if it succeeds. And uh, what actually came out of our, of our research is that uh, it's not good. When you start with a group, you have to continue with that group until it gives you the, the result or fails. So that's uh, how we deal with, uh, with groups. We compute the compound probability of, uh, of the group. It's, uh, here are the formulas, it's basically uh, uh, execute an action, if it works, uh, then execute the second one. And you sort all the strategies with always the, the same coefficient, which is the time divided by the probability, and uh, execute until it, it fails or gives you the, the result. And uh, then we get to, uh, to attack trees. Uh, in, in attack trees, you have, um, between the, the assets and the, the actions, you have an or relation. No? If you want a system agent, you can uh, get it through a remote exploit or a client-side exploit, or here uh, an SQL injection and then convert it to, to system. And uh, the requirements of the, of the actions have an and relation. No, if you want to execute the remote exploit, well, you need DOS and the host and the port. And if you want uh, to execute the SQL injection, you need the web app and the credentials to, uh, to get access. Um, 
So here the, the difference with uh, the previous one is that uh, we don't know the, the order in each group. Uh, so we have uh, the additional problem of how to order the, the actions in each group. So uh, how would you order them? You always have the same information, you know, the probability of success and uh, the expected running time. So I want to throw a guess. And, uh, well, uh, in, in the groups, since uh, you start uh, executing things and uh, you stop when uh, someone fails or all the auctions are uh, successful and give you the result, the trick is uh, that you uh, have to sort them according to the probability of failure. So now we always compute the same coefficient, time divided by probability, but now it's the probability of a failure that, that we use. And uh, so this is the lemma, and uh, the intuition is that, that uh, if you have a action that has higher probability of failure, then test it first, and if it doesn't work, well, you skip to the, to the next group. And uh, the, the last scenario is uh, when you have several levels uh, like this of assets and, and actions, and uh, so this is uh, basically almost the, the real scenario. And well, the solution is simply to uh, compose all the, the previous algorithms. When you have a group bounded by an unrelation, relation, okay, we know that we can compute the combined probability and consider it as a single node. And uh, when you have a, an OR group, you sort them and you consider the, the first one as the one that will be executed. So that way we re reduce the, the group of nodes until we, we get a single path. And uh, this is where dynamic uh, replanning comes in, because uh, this plan will give you um, a set of actions to get to the result. But once uh, you start executing the action, uh, the numbers may, may vary. The, um, the structure of the graph will be the same, but the numbers will change. So uh, that's how we use it. We build a plan with, uh, I don't know, maybe 40, uh, 40 actions, and after we execute the, the first action, based on the result, we feed back the plan and uh, replan on that. And I just want to show you briefly this in action. So um, here I have the, all these things modeled in a, in a planning language called uh, PDDL. And uh, this is how uh, an exploit will, will look like. Uh, the action is, uh, for example, CVS uh, flag insertion, and the parameters are the, the source host and the target host. And the preconditions, well, is to have uh, the source host uh, compromised, to have an agent there, and to have uh, TCP connectivity between the source and the target on port uh, 2401, and that uh, the target has the, the correct application, no, the CVS service, and has a Linux Red Hat install. And the agent uh, defect will be to install an agent uh, with high privilege in, the, in this case, and to increase the time and the uncertainty about the result. So that way we, we model all the, the exploits. And uh, uh, briefly, and here we have also the, the description of the particular scenario where we have uh, um, the host with uh, the different uh, IP addresses, and we have networks, and we have uh, common facts, blah blah blah, blah, blah connectivity, etc. And uh, the goal is to obtain the, the private key of, uh, of the both. And we want to uh, minimize the time plus uh, 10 times the uncertainty here. And I will show it uh, running in this scenario. So it's not very big. You have like uh, uh, 40 machines on three different networks. And this is the, the result of the, of the planner. Ah, shit. And well, simply it, it gives you a plan with, uh, with uh, the steps and the parameters. No, it, uh, it starts with uh, the local host attacking the, the web server and uh, executing, I don't know, 38 actions. In the last action is uh, actually to, to get the, the private key of the both. And, uh, and this example was small, but look, the planner took 
just one second to, to run. So briefly, the, the conclusion is that uh, we are looking at attack, attack planning from uh, the attacker's point of view. No, there are lots of uh, other guys that uh, consider it from, uh, from the defender's point of view. So um, uh, they don't think about what the attackers know. No, and, and as obviously we're building a tool for attacking, uh, we have to consider that and put information, information gathering into the, the planning steps and model the, the information that the attackers has about the, the network. And uh, we also extended the, the classical attack graphs with those uh, numerical effects, which is the, the expected running time in the example and uh, the probability of success. And we've made this uh, algorithm that uh, doesn't work in all the scenarios, but uh, in the scenarios that uh, I've shown you, it works, and we have demonstrated that it gives you the, the optimal solution. So that's, uh, I think that's a cool result, because if you know that in, your, in this scenario, okay, this is the, this is the best solution. And uh, so when, when you stumble upon that, okay, you're sure that you already know how to, how to handle it. And, uh, and this is uh, an idea of, of future research is um, that since we have a very efficient algorithm, we're not worried uh, anymore to have lots of uh, different actions. So now maybe an exploit, instead of considering as a simple uh, atomic action, we can split it into uh, several sub-actions. And uh, here I have an example where it, it takes sense. This is the, the exploit for the, you know, the, the vulnerability in, in Debian OpenSSL, where they, they fucked up the, the number generator. And, uh, and the result was that uh, there were only 32,000 possible keys. And uh, the exploit is simply to brute force all the, the possible keys. But uh, there is something uh, interesting is that the, the key dependent on the, on the process ID. And, uh, and so there were process IDs that uh, are more probable. So you can, uh, you can refine the, the execution of this model. No, you can compute the, the probability of the keys. And you can uh, execute the exploit only for the more probable keys, then skip to another exploit which has a better chances. And you, if all the exploits, uh, if all the other exploits fail, then come back to this one and continue with the less probable keys. So this is a, this is something for future research, and we hope that it will give like more control over the, the exploit execution and finally minimize the, the total execution time. So that's what I wanted to present to you. Thank you. Senhores, é, eu sei que já está bastante tarde, nós temos uma palestra de 15 minutos do Juliano, então ele vai dar a palestra e aí a gente vai para o almoço. Bom, gostaria de, de... Bom, a palestra também é, vai ser em inglês, tá? Então, o pessoal está lá. Bom, então aqui com vocês o Juliano. Hello. Yes, aqui é eu sou um dos main developers of Netifera. And I will try to explain to you very quickly what is Netifera, what we, uh, we are trying to do, and what you can do now with Netifera. That is a computer program that you can download and use it. So the, it is open source, and it's a platform. Platform is a word that is being used for a lot of different things. But the idea is that we are not doing only one feature, but a platform to create security tools. And we are a team of people working on security for a lot of years, more than 10, uh, researching and also working in companies that make uh, commercial security products, like Core Impact, for example. And the idea is that we are trying to, we think that the best way to create security tools is like making them open source and giving them away for free because it's the best way to test them. A lot of people can use them and it's like, like the tools have a natural evolution, something like that. And when we started, we didn't have any one single feature that we wanted to do. We wanted to do a lot of different things, but the, every tool that we wanted to do 
uh, had like a common set of capabilities that need, for example, to access the network or the operating system. And so we started making that, making the capabilities. So on top of that, you can create tools. Uh, the tools that I am talking, the kind of tool that I am talking about are things like uh, network mapping, network scan, that kind of things to get information from networks and computers in the network. And also when you can access a computer, if you are a hacker, a penetration tester, or the administrator of a network, also to get information from that computer. So the, the idea is that we can get give the, to the developers of tools like uh, that platform that instead of they, when they want to do a new tool, they don't need to write everything. They can start with like the common, the common capabilities that we provide. They don't have to do the user interface. They can reuse what we, are, our user interface. Not only that, but the, the network, libraries, and access to the system. And the idea is that you have a lot of tools using the same platform. The components of that platform that is very modular uh, get are better because a lot of people use it. So when you make a new tool, you get that as an advantage. So you, if you are doing, I don't know, uh, some scanner for some application, you don't need to write your own port scanner and network scanner or the user interface for that. And the benefit for user is that when one is that that you have the same user interface. So uh, if, and if the interface is easy to use, that we think that our user interface is very used to, easy to use. Uh, you have all the tools in, a set, in the same place. You know how to use it. You don't have to learn a lot of new commands for every new tool that you want. You try to use. And uh, you also have the, uh, all the information in the same place, the information that you collect from the network or from one single system. And we want to build a community around that, so you have uh, a place to ask for help to other users. And it's not only one tool that you maybe have to go to one place to ask for help for one tool, another place for another tool. It's all in the same place. Well, and one of the components of the platform, and that maybe is the most, is, is something that doesn't exist in, uh, in another tool, is the probe. The probe is a, is a virtual machine. The idea is that the same program that you can run in your, in your computer, you want to run them in remote systems. For example, when you do a penetration test or when you are the administrator of a network, you need to be able to run the same tools from your computer or from another computer to get information from those remote computers or to be able to scan from different points in a network. So the probe allows you to do that. You don't need to you don't need to upload a lot of different programs to a remote computer. You only upload the probe, and you can run any of the tools that work in your computer. You can run them in the remote computer. And it's, it's like, like the, well, uh, now I'm going to show you the, the user interface. But the probe is exactly like that. It's the same program that you run in your computer, but with, without the, use, the user interface, because you connect to it through the network. And you can install a lot of probes and make them work, do something, and you can go somewhere else, and then you return and you connect to the probes to get the information. Well, now I will show it. That's how it looks. You have a, that input box that is like a web browser input box. There you can type IP addresses or domain names or web addresses. And when you do that, it, it has that uh, new element that we call entity that to the space, the space is like a document in Word or a tab in a browser. 
That, that one is a network. It's not a single computer. It's a network, a large 24 network. Then I go with the mouse there, and I have some options, some actions that I can do. Those actions are single tools. If you write a new tool, it will be there in that list. Mm -hmm. So it's very extensible. Everything is modular and extensible. Well, well <clears throat> what I do now is to scan the that. I scan the whole network, but there is only one computer. Then I discover the TCP services on that computer. And the idea is that I will try to guess a username and a password to install a prop. Once I have the prop installed, I can run more programs in that computer. So what I do now is brute force, is to guess usernames and passwords. I select a list of common usernames. So what I did there was to, I select the SSH service, the secure shell service that I discovered using the port scanner. And I try a lot of usernames and passwords. Well, not a lot, but <laughs> some. And I got one that is test test. Now I try to do the, the same but with only one username, the root username, that is the administrator. And with a list of passwords. This is only one example of one uh, tool. It's not that. The idea is you can create your own tools or and extend it. It's very extensive. It's, you can write the plugin and it will be completely integrated to the rest. Well, and now I use that. Well, the password was very easy, was root, and there you can see. I don't know if you can see, <laughs> but it says root and the password that is one, two, three, four. And now I use that pa username and that password to install the prop. It's not a real, of course it is not real. I did the, this to, just an example. It's a virtual machine. <coughs> so, I have the system with the prop installed. And now I will use that, that prop to get information from from that machine, from the hard disk of that machine. What I do is I select the probe and I create a new space. The space is that you, you will see like a new tab in a browser. But everything, every action that I do in that new space is going to happen in the probe, not in my computer. So now it's, it looks like the same, but if you look here, let me try. Oh, sorry. Well, I cannot zoom, but if you see there, it says my probe instead of local probe. My probe. That means that is everything that I am doing is running in the remote computer. So the first thing that I do is to, to scan again the same computer using the local the, ad, the IP address of the loopback. And now, well, I have a lot of well, not a lot, but I have some options that that I can choose on that probe. For example, I can broke the file system. That is like a file manager that I am using in the remote system. It's the file system of the remote system. And the next step is to show you some, to run a program on that computer to collect information from the file system, like username, passwords, and yes, 
mainly username and password and the configuration of the machine. So I select that tool that of course is not running in my computer, it's running in the remote system. And I, those are modules of that of that tool. You can write your own module that get information from some specific file names. And I get usernames and passwords from files in the hard disk of that machine. It's just an example of what I can do in the remote computer. I also have the, the encrypted password that I can try to crack later. And information about the computer, like the operating system, uh, memory that I also get from the file system. And now I will show you, well, we are doing it uh, to help people to secure their networks or to do penetration testing, but also we like to use it as a toy to learn about networks. And so we have some features that are not very useful, but are fun. And the latest one is a map of the internet that I have to show. Looks better like this. Yes. The idea is that we want to have some visualization. Well, we, we want to ha have many visualizations of the information <coughs> because sometimes you scan a lot of, yes, you scan a big network and you have a lot of information and it's difficult to, to use it, to work with it. So we made that map that is all the IP uh, address space of IPv4. So what I did there is to scan the Netifera web server and it shows it on that map. I can zoom in in the map and it gives information about the geographical location of that machine. Every, that is the Lash 16 network, ah, you cannot see, ah, yes, Lash 16. And the, the info, the names of cities and places in the, related to the network. Then I just start scanning. Every red point is a new machine that is covered. And the color is related to the amount of computers in that block, in that, the network. So it's a visualization and with just few computers, maybe it's not very useful, but the idea is that we can scan the whole internet and show it there. And it's interesting to learn about networks and how the internet works. And yes, well. now I will scan a bigger network and you will see the results in the map. This is something that you can download and try. Uh, is the idea is that we are going to release more and more features, but we are trying to make some that are fun to use, so people can try and play with the interface and try to imagine what you can do in the future using the same platform to create new things. And now I will show the the scan of the same network finishing. Uh, 
And as you see, one of the things that we want to do is to make everything very visual, or not like most uh, security tools now, or man, many are command line only text. And if you are working with a lot of information, it's difficult to use. The idea is to make tools very, very easy to use, so you can concentrate on something else that learning to use the tools. So in the future, we are, we are going to make more visualizations, experiment with that. This is not the real speed of the scan. <laughs> yes. uh, you said uh, we can write our own tools. Yes. In what language? Java. Uh, I didn't say that before. But Java? Yes. OK. But we have plans to include a scripting language. There are a lot of scripting languages that run inside the virtual machine of Java. But nowadays, this? Only Java, yes. But it's a good language. <laughs> and I would like to show you a real scan, but I don't have internet uh, access here, so I, I, what I show is a video, and the speed is not real, it's faster. But, well, that is everything that I have to show. I would like you to download it and try it. So you can go there and download. Now we have a version for Linux and for Mac, but we are going to release a version for Windows soon. If you want to contact me or to chat with with us, you can connect, use that IRC channel. Thank you.